What planet do we live on? I live on planet America. I analyzed a full day of CNN. That's 6 a.m. to midnight, 18 hours. I watched every hour, including many of the commercials. And in order to tell you about what I found, I have to tell you about a drug called remdesivir. Remdesivir is made by Gilead. It was originally created to treat Ebola, but recently they studied its effects on people suffering from the current virus. So let's talk now about remdesivir because there was some early hope. Uh, there was some news last week that, that, that uh, a study didn't pan out on this. I mean, is there anything conclusive at this point? No, there is nothing conclusive. And it's interesting, Gilead is playing this very differently than some of the other pharmaceutical companies. They put out a press release that talked about looking at five days of treatment with remdesivir versus 10 days and saying that it looked about the same. There doesn't seem to be a difference. You know, it's, it's, it's good to know, but it's not so helpful to patients to know that five days works as well as 10. What they want to know is, does this work at all compared to doing nothing? They don't have an answer to that just now. That was senior medical correspondent, Elizabeth Cohen, reporting that this drug will shorten your symptoms, but other than that, it might not really have any serious effect. From 6 a.m. until 12.40, that's almost seven hours, that was the only mention of remdesivir. And then this happened. That means that Dr. we're going to have to I'm sorry I need to interrupt you at this point. Okay, we need to so go to the White House now, the President of the United States, with Dr. Fauci and the Governor of Louisiana. The data shows that remdesivir has a clear-cut, significant, positive effect. It is a very important proof of concept. And then the tone changed. Breaking news. Remdesivir. Remdesivir. Dr. Anthony Fauci shared today what he described as good. A potential breakthrough. One of the best headlines since coronavirus took hold of the United States. A coronavirus patient who was treated with remdesivir. Do you think this was the key to your recovery? Um, he hesitated because he couldn't possibly know the answer to that. Um, so. What was not a big deal only a couple hours ago, CNN decided to spin it into the biggest headline of the day through sheer volume of coverage. Not only did every show cover this, some shows are multiple hours, which means they covered it twice. Dr. Dr. Anthony, Anthony Fauci, Fauci expressing optimistic optimism about a today possible about a drug study treatment of the for antiviral the drug remdesivir. They brought in multiple doctors to talk about this, doctors who had nothing more to add. All they could do was vamp and conjecture and restate what was already said in Fauci's clip. It is a very important proof of concept. A proof of concept. A great proof of concept. Proof of a concept. Under other circumstances, John, we wouldn't be talking about this on your program. Even if this is as significant as they purport, it still doesn't merit the hours that CNN allotted to it because the discussion on it is so limited. And then there was the evolution and attitude for the people who had to comment on it hour after hour throughout the day. Remember Elizabeth Cohen from 9 a.m.? It's not so helpful to patients to know that five days works as well as 10. Does this work at all compared to doing nothing? Well, this is that same Elizabeth Cohen eight hours later. How significant are these initial results? They're very, they're very significant. I mean, hopefully this drug will make a difference, not only in and of itself, but it is a proof of concept. Doctor after correspondent after doctor commenting on what little they had to go on until this story came full circle with this. Is it a cause to leave your house and to start being cavalier? No, and I don't know why you people are hyping it that way online. Chris, I can answer that for you. It's because you work at a counterfeit news network whose primary objective is to keep Gen Xers watching long enough that they buy a Ninja Foodie grill and then sign up for Weight Watchers. And I'll tell you why I think they decided to make remdesivir such a story to begin with. But first, the remdesivir story illustrates a couple things. One, it shows their gluttonous desperation for a sensational story, which is in part to maintain ratings because ratings equal ad revenue, of which they make more than a million dollars a day. And two, it illustrates how few stories they actually cover. Because if you think that they covered dozens of other stories and headlines that day, you would be wrong. On this day of coverage, they featured about 20 stories some stories were only featured on one or two shows, but some stories were featured on more than half the shows. For example, Jared Kushner trying to pretend the White House has handled the virus successfully was featured at 9, 11, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., and 7 p.m. 
The GDP going down was featured at 6 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 11 a.m., 1 p.m., and 4 p.m. States reopening was talked about in some form or another on every single hour of programming. And you hear that and maybe you say, okay, if they spend so much time on just a few stories, they must have gone on to some great detail. No. Actually, the discussions are shockingly devoid of detail because every show covers every topic independently, so they can never build on anything. So even though CNN as a whole might have spent over an hour talking about remdesivir, the guests only get five minutes at a time to go into it. And I think this immense broadcasting shortcoming is actually most apparent with the reporters in the field. When you look at just these three plants alone, they account for more than half of all, all the virus. virus, virus, virus. That was Omar Jimenez giving a report on how Trump has used the Defense Production Act to order meat processing plants to stay open. Over the course of about 12 hours, he came back to the same spot to give the same report over and over. The first time I saw it, I had to go back and make sure I hadn't restarted the last episode again, but no, because you can see the light changing behind him. But let's stay on the meat processing story for a minute. This story was mentioned on 13 separate hours of coverage. President Trump saying today that meat processing plants across the country are thrilled with this new executive order requiring them to remain open. That might be true, of course, coming from executives, but what about the workers? That was one of the only mentions of Trump's collaboration with corporations on this story. This is a story about workers and what abuses they endure. But the way CNN tells it, the workers are but a conduit to talk about Trump. Now, Trump is definitely at fault. There's no question he deserves blame. But I want you to see the difference between CNN, which uses workers as a kind of game piece to talk about Trump and has little interest in taking real umbrage with the companies. President Trump ordering meat processing plants to stay open, but workers are getting sick. And other coverage, which seeks actually to highlight the plight of the workers. As one Smithfield worker described to the Washington Post, on the cut floor, we use knives to butcher up to 1,100 pigs an hour as they come down a mechanical line into specific cuts like a loin. To keep up with the speed of the line, workers stand so closely together that they can easily be cut by the person next to them. It was a dangerous, hard job every day before the coronavirus, but managers never blatantly asked me to risk my life just by showing up until this pandemic. And while CNN routinely eschews any opportunity to make substantive criticisms of big business and instead defers basically all the blame to Trump, Crystal Ball takes a more serious approach. So many of these plant closures were completely avoidable if only these companies were just slightly less filled with unconscionable levels of greed. JBS, Tyson's, and Smithfield utterly failed their workers in their quest to keep up production speed in service of the almighty dollar. Same thing with this story. GDP dropping 4.8%. In the end, the difference between economic recession, economic depression, don't even want to go there, and economic recovery comes down to consumer confidence. The stock market reaction for me today is what's critical. Of course, things like consumer confidence, GDP, or the stock market reaction are things that probably mean next to nothing for the average person watching. And it certainly fails to convey the entire reason we talk about the economy, which is, presumably, people's financial standing and their ability to prosper. And they never question the actual connection between the Dow being up and someone's ability to make ends meet. And they seem to generally opt to talk about things like GDP rather than say, Something like this. Millions of U.S. workers who've lost their jobs have been unable to file for unemployment benefits with state agencies unable to keep up with the sheer volume of new claims. More egregious was an interview Aaron Burnett did with Gary Cohn, who served in the Economic Council under Trump. They were discussing various states' reopening plans and the governor of Iowa, who essentially said, we're reopening the state, and if you don't go back to work because you're afraid of getting sick, that's you quitting and we're cutting off your unemployment. CNN had rightly highlighted earlier what a monster the governor of Iowa is, but look at what happens here. Right now, if you're collecting unemployment, you could be getting 100% of wages or 100% plus of wages. And remember, you may have kids at home. So as the governor said, if you're not willing to go back in the workforce, the governor may cut off some of those benefits to change that equation of what the opportunity cost to stay home is versus the opportunity cost to re-enter the workforce. 
So, you know, when all this comes in terms of the spending here. No pushback from Burnett. And so this anti-worker talking point is taken totally seriously by the anchor. And while this former president of Goldman Sachs is explaining why it's necessary to crack the whip on poor people who are probably still living on the cusp of poverty, but at least not having to kill themselves for the privilege, how many furloughed workers did they interview that day? And finally, let me talk about Donald Trump. Trump was invoked during every hour of coverage. And the truth is, it was often gratuitous. Sometimes Trump isn't even really part of the conversation when they bring him up, but the anchors force him on the guests. Have you heard from the well, White House? Have you heard from the decision makers on this? So, so President Trump today um, said, Bob, that he didn't like a proposal that had been supported by the uh, Arizona governor. The president seemingly downplayed the need for testing, saying, I don't know that all of that is even necessary. Uh, what's your reaction? And so the big story on this particular day was remarks he made about test numbers. You said that we will very soon be testing 5 million people. Well, I don't know where it came five million, yeah. when you said that. Do I think we will? I think we will, but I never said it. Okay, he's a liar and an idiot, and he's criminally negligent. That's actually not news. We know this already, and certainly there is nothing special about this particular iteration of his dishonesty. And again, none of these attacks on Trump are necessarily unfair. It's just not journalistic or honest to spend so much time on Trump that he becomes the singular villain in the world. Because by Trump absorbing all the blame, a lot of very blameworthy people probably get off scot-free. And then the inverse is why I think they allowed themselves to make the Remdesivir story the story du jour. Because in this latest season of the reality TV show otherwise known as the Trump administration, Dr. Fauci has become something of a protagonist. And now anything that Dr. Fauci says can be spun into a big story which helps confirm how stupid and terrible Trump and all the people in his orbit are. And one of the worst parts about this is how CNN deceives its viewers into thinking they're informed, when in reality they're simply reminding their viewers who the antagonists and protagonists are. Because while CNN reminded viewers over and over that Mike Pence is a dick because he refuses to wear his mask, this was happening. Workers at some of the biggest corporations in the United States are planning an unprecedented wave of strikes on May 1st. And while CNN reminded you that Trump lied about his own remarks on the COVID test numbers, this was happening. Riots are breaking out inside juvenile jails across the U.S., and some youths have attempted to escape as coronavirus cases mount. And while they found time to bring on Bob Costas to talk about baseball reopening. Bob, this is breaking the hearts of millions. Well, I think that Dr. Fauci would be among the heartbroken. This was happening. The World Health Organization says it's preparing to slash humanitarian aid to Yemen's healthcare system by as much as 80 percent. And this is probably the most valuable thing I've learned from this experiment. I've learned why Generation X and baby boomers who watch CNN all day can think that Democrats are always the good guys. And the absolute most important thing in the world is getting Trump out of office. Because in CNN's endless project of maintaining ratings and ad revenue, they have the immense financial pressure of pleasing their audience. Which means in this day of coverage, I didn't count a single negative comment about a Democrat. Negative stories about Trump were repeated way beyond their usefulness. And the talk about the economy revolves around GDP and the market and not around actual people who are actually suffering. And were already suffering before the virus. But I realized something else. Maybe it's not fair to judge CNN as a huge news network with endless resources and 18 hours to play with. Because every hour is exactly the same as every other hour. Really what CNN is, is a single hour long show that is re-performed at all hours so that anyone tuning in at any time can catch it and not miss anything. It's really off off Broadway journalism with endless matinees. And I truly don't understand why they don't just take the first hour and repeat it throughout the day. It would be way cheaper and you'd lose basically nothing. And that's my takeaway from 18 hours of CNN. It was an absolute punishment to watch and they are a factory of pseudo journalism that's better at hawking Medicare Advantage plans than it is at elucidating current events. That being said, the full day of Fox News is probably gonna be even worse. So please like and subscribe if you wanna see that video or if you wanna see more manufacturing consent videos, thanks for watching. Later.